Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow panelists, I'm honored to welcome you to this discussion on decarbonization of the Harbourcraft segment. My name is Imran and today we are here to explore how we can achieve our goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the segment while ensuring that we continue to provide efficient and sustainable solutions. So the backdrop, the backdrop to this discussion here is, as we all know, from 2030, MPA will require the Harbourcraft, which refers to any kinds of vessels that plies only within Singapore waters to be fully electric, ready to run on pure biofuels, or compatible with net zero fuels such as hydrogen. I am excited to be joined today by four distinguished panelists, each of whom brings a unique perspective to the discussion. Um, our ship owner, uh, Tommy on the right here, will provide insights you know, on the challenges and opportunities of implementing decarbonization solutions or for the hypercraft sector. Uh, the solutions provider, Srinivas, will perhaps discuss innovative technologies and strategies to reduce emissions. Our systems integrator, George, will share insights on how technology can be integrated into existing systems to optimize performance and reduce emissions. And last but not least, our patent office expert, Sun Ting, will provide insights into the latest developments in green technology and its potential impact to the maritime industry. So as we embark on the discussion, I urge you all to engage, share your thoughts, and be open to new ideas. Let's take advantage of the wealth of experience and knowledge we have in the room to generate fresh insights, new ideas, and innovative solutions. So without further ado, can I perhaps pass the time now to Sun Ting first? You know, provide your introduction as well as from your vantage point, your experience, your background and perspective, what are your thoughts you know, on, on the Hubbercraft and the roadmap to net zero? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Yumran. Maybe a little bit background of myself. When you see a patent, you're looking for lawyers or lawsuits. Actually, I'm not. I'm talk today about the technology. What our team doing is uh, we use uh, global patent publications as a lens to look at the technology landscape. What are the latest uh, technology development? And uh, especially our recent study focused on the green technologies, the green fuels, low carbon fuels, and how they apply to marine time applications. So perhaps I can share uh, one thing, because for the panel, right, we see many uh, service providers, uh, solutions providers, and also ship owners focus quite a lot maybe on batteries and uh, low fuels. Uh, I will share one thing uh, could be uh, many people maybe forgot the technology, which is fuel cell. Our, based on our patent data, we look at uh, past year's patent publications. We noticed that for fuel cell technologies, it's picking up for marine time applications. But if you compare, looking at the overview, at the big picture, what is fuel cells going, right? We take a step back about 10 years ago. We we'll look at the EV, electrical vehicles, and fuel cells, it, it could be comparable. But the EV is moving really fast. Nowadays, uh, many, uh, 16 to 17 millions of EV cars on the road. But the fuel cell cars, only maybe 40,000 sold as of last year. So we see the technology is slightly moving different, but now I would say based on the patent data, we can see for fuel cells, technology is already there. It's just how you bring technology to your local industry, to your perspective, so that it can be further applied with your own technology's uh, perspective and apply for money time. This is very important. And I think I will just stop here. I will pass around to see other solutions as well, yeah? Thanks, Sun Ting. So George, Technology is really there, actually. From a systems uh, integrated point of view, um, any thoughts from you? Yeah, uh, so just a bit about myself. I'm uh, uh, George Lee, uh, CEO of Seaforest. Uh, Seaforest actually is a system integrator. Uh, so answering to the question, basically the way we see it is uh, there are uh, enabling technology available now. What we now need to uh, uh, do as an industry, which is what uh, we have also been advocating, is to actually uh, take a step change approach. We have been looking at uh, uh, electrifications of the harbor craft and preparing it for uh, the 2030 and 2050 targets that MPF set up for. 
in order to do that, we have to create a systems that are, or infrastructure system on the vessels that is uh, future proof. So uh, in order for you to be able to uh, do the subsequent change out to either uh, uh, alternative fuel or to add more uh, uh, battery systems or energy storage systems uh, when the infrastructure is built. Currently now, what we see from our point of view is that a lot of our clients are uh, having a problem of um, a wait and see or taking a wait and see attitude. They're looking at different, uh, different approaches that is available in the market because there's so many of them. But as of now, it's very difficult to iron out what is going to be the prevailing technology that will be used, even alternative fuel. So um, from, from the vantage point that we are seeing as a system grader, we see a lot more opportunities that uh, can be done in terms of creating uh, uh, systems on vessels that can future be future-proof. Uh, that means you can actually convert it in the uh, future. Uh, and we believe that uh, that is the way to go. Thanks, Josh. So a wait and see approach. Uh, Incent, uh, from Srinivas's point of view, perhaps, you know, do you share this as well? Do you, do you, do you uh, typically articulate this to the, to the clients? Uh, yeah, well, uh, for us, I would say it's not more of wait and see, it's more act and show. So it's uh, to take some uh, actions forward. Now, as, as we in Ensign Green Tech said, right, we, we've always been very focused on the green services that we want to bring in, and Maritime has been one of our biggest segments we've entered into. Uh, technologies are there. The, the, the technologies have been there. Uh, the technologies have been enhancing over time. It's just that we need to start adapting it and trying to put it into the action uh, on ground. And that's the first step we decided. We said we just do it. We just go for it, uh, and we selected a few segments. So for us, we believed in a full electric vessel. So we believed in a completely battery-operated vessel. Not all vessels can be fully battery-operated, but we selected a segment that is suitable for Singapore, which covers about 30% of the market share. That's the crew transfer and the cargo vessels. Uh, sorry, the light cargo vessels for it. And we decided to act on it. But we have a dual approach also. We do know the technologies are there, and there are a lot of emerging technologies with very smart people in the startup communities that are bringing in some uh, further enhanced versions of what we can. And some of them are, it's not necessary that one industry means it has to behave one way. So we looked at industries across, see what is applicable to us, uh, what can be something that can really create uh, either an efficiency or a disruption. And in that factor, we've also invested in like-minded companies to make sure that we are able to give them a showcase to come and put the uh, uh, technologies inside and prove for it. Thanks, Rinivas. I think we can touch on that again, which are the companies perhaps you see yeah, will be exciting times. Um, last but not least, I think the most important you know, perspective here in the room, the user's perspective. Tommy, would you articulate a bit more? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Imran. Uh, my name is Tommy, so glad to be here today. Maybe just a short introduction. So I currently wear two hats. Firstly, as the director of Inghub Shipping. So Inghub Shipping is a family-run business, heritage stems along the route, the banks of the Singapore River, many years ago, affectionately known as Ang Ting. So today, we operate a fleet of 70 vessels, tugs, ferries, multi-cat workboat, based out of our yard in Singapore. If you have family or relatives, uh, done a national service in Pulau Tekong, probably been about one of our ferries before. So secondly, I'm also the founder of Pixis. Pixis is a maritime electrification technology startup. Up. So Pixis aspires for mass adoption and commercialization of electric coastal vessels in Asia, in the world, aspire to be the Tesla of the sea. So where we are at uh, right now, where we are looking at it, a lot of macro forces that are reshaping maritime today. One of the most important, like the different panel, esteemed panel speakers are talking about decarbonization and sustainability. There's a big push, Singapore front, the green plan, MPA's decarbonization blueprint. Where we are at right now, a lot of our customers Customers are already calling for us to provide green solutions. Say, Tommy, if you want to tender for my project, give me a green solution, electric vessel, hybrid vessel, feeling which they wouldn't even consider our tender bid. So, Inghub Shipping being a very traditional company, 30-year-old maritime business, we need, like many other maritime businesses, to change and to pivot. Otherwise, we risk becoming irrelevant in the next generations to come. Thanks, thanks. So, the drivers are definitely uh, multi-pronged. 
Um, so perhaps to yourself, uh, Tommy, would you articulate more on, on Pixis? Would you want to elaborate more what, what you do over there as well? So actually, one of the reasons why we started Pixis is because uh, the entire decarbonization push is redefining the landscape of maritime businesses today. So then we realized that the exact same problems that our organizations was facing are the same issues that so many other companies in Singapore, in Asia are all facing as well, big or small. So in the midst of this storm, actually, we've also found the seeds of opportunity. So about a year ago, we gathered a group of like-minded individuals for maritime and for non-maritime as well with a common vision to revolutionize and to transform the coastal maritime sector. And hence, we founded Pixis. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Tommy. Speaking about non-maritime related industries, to perhaps to, to Sun Ting, uh, you mentioned about the power as well as the, uh, the car industry. Um, what sort of solutions do you see over there that could be marinized here? Okay, uh, very often when we look at patent data, look at the specific technologies to use for industry, we zoom out a little bit to see whether the technology is ready and whether it has been applied in other industries. Take the battery as an example. If we think about uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, the batteries, uh, lithium ion batteries, is well established for only portable electronics like cell phones or computers, right? It takes about eight to 10 years when the industry want to assemble the technology, assemble all the battery cells into big battery packs for the automotive industry, right? And then it takes another maybe three to four years to let the bring in those battery makers, which is typically looking at battery packs, how they can make it more concise, more smaller size and more powerful, and bring down the cost. This is very important because the technology itself I think uh, yesterday we also heard from the distinguished guests that technology itself, very often the users or the industries that don't care about it. It's about how you can bring in the cost, bring down the cost, bring the benefits to the, to the uh, uh, ship owners or the uh, uh, industry players. So we can see for batteries, it moves quite smoothly because it has a foundation from small scale portable electronics to the large scale battery packs, and now they're moving on to trucks, to aviation, to large scales, and moving towards power sector. Because the price is already bring down, then the, the, the power sector, the, the suppliers are using this to, uh, for the power intermittency to connect to those uh, renewable energies. And we can see this trend goes quite smoothly. But for other technologies like green fuels, or even fuel cells, at a certain stage, technology is quite ready there but nobody coming in to bring down the cost or make it more integrated towards the industry solutions. I think this is the key challenge and the gap. So what uh, we really encourage the uh, startups like InHub and also the service uh, integrators, the technology integrators, to look at this focus on this specifically gap so that how you can bring the technologies, make it suitable for our own industry. This is very important. Thanks, thanks. I guess just a slight correction there. Uh, Inkhub is not a startup. They, they are really a mature business, yeah? Um, so for George, um, where do you see the opportunities from a systems integrator's point of view? And how, how do you address that in your own company's strategy? Um, maybe what I will do is that I will touch on this by um, uh, just uh, running through a bit about how C4S has uh, walked this journey on decarbonization or creating solutions and technology for the sustainable, uh, for the sustainability of a uh, maritime industry. Uh, so we, we started our, our um, uh, development in terms of sustainable solutions uh, in 2019. Now, throughout the whole initial years, uh, the first two, three years, it was actually pretty uh, uh, difficult. It was very lonely because a lot of times when we go around, uh, the industry looking for, for, for co even components. Uh, there's very few companies who are able to provide uh, uh, even components like motors, uh, even battery system for very, very small craft like harbor craft. Uh, the bigger vessels and the bigger systems that are available, but not on the smaller systems. So uh, uh, what, what it eventually drive us is that we started buying um, individuals and going to source individual components around the world and create a control system and uh, turn it into an energy management system that we are now fully developing 
and we have a, a whole team of uh, programmers in our company actually doing the uh, optimization of the system. Now, what, what this does is that it creates a certain opportunity for uh, other system graders to work with us, although we ourselves are system graders, so that in due time, we create a platform for people to be able to use and integrate so that we can expand the different solutions that are available. Currently now, we're developing, uh, just like what uh, Dr. Sun Ting has uh, mentioned about fuel cell and even uh, other form of uh, uh, electric uh, gen power generation. So all this has to be put into the system uh, so that you can actually uh, uh, create different options and solutions for the industry. Now, current uh, solutions that we provide, like a hybrid system, full electric ready solutions, uh, charging solutions, all these are, are still in development. There are a lot of uh, potentials and a lot of uh, um, different iterations that can come out of it. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that's where it is. Thanks, thanks, Josh. I think we've touched upon a lot on electrification as well as on fuel cells, and I'm just going through the questions here. Um, biofuels. So biofuels are known to have a number of disadvantages, including but not limited to high viscosity, lower energy output, and high, high engine wear. Given this, is it economically and practically viable? Perhaps Srinivas, would you like to uh, share some perspectives on that? Sure, probably you're asking someone who's purely focused on electrification 100%. <laughs> uh, well, as I said, uh, the vessel market is quite diverse uh, in what we are in. Uh, we are right now focusing on 100% battery operated vessels, but there are vessels that will need, uh, that cannot just be on a purely battery base only. Uh, and in that context, I would say hybrid solutions will be uh, a dominance, but you cannot take out the battery out of the vessel. The battery will be uh, a part of the vessel in any form or the other. So uh, at this point in time, we, uh, we really haven't started focusing too much on alternative fuels because we want to get where we want with the 100% electric uh, vessel on batteries. So um, probably I won't be much to say on how the biofuels chemistry is, is useful for us, but yeah. Thanks, thanks. Apologies for that. How about, uh, Tommy, from a user's perspective, have you, um, are you looking into biofuels as well? You know, Thanks, Dr. Imran. I think I agree as well with the panelists, fellow panelists, that I think eventually it will include a whole mixture of different technological solutions. So we believe the, the whole goal towards net zero. There isn't any magic uh, one size fit all formula that can turn the entire fleet net zero overnight. You have a big mix of uh, different technological sources, including biofuel, including hydrogen, electrification, or even new alternative uh, fuel source. But I think, like what you, you mentioned, Dr. Imran, I think it's very important important to recognize and to appreciate there are different characteristics for these energy sources. They have their advantages, but they also bring about their set of limitations. Uh, maybe, for example, uh, what we try to do is to try to best match the characteristics of this new fuel source to the operating profile of our current vessel type. Our ferries, for example, short distances, point to point, travel five, six nautical miles. So in instances such as that, we can size up the operating profile, we can electrify them with motors, with batteries, with software. Then maybe for our tugboats, for example, they require very high bullet pool. They need to exert at high engine load, sustain duration of time, pushing or towing heavy equipment over bodies of water from one place uh, to another. So in that kind of situation, perhaps maybe biofuel might be a bit more applicable to find the right match for the, the, the right vessel type. So for us, we try as much as possible to keep a very agile, adaptable mindset so we can size up the correct solution to match the operating profile of our vessel. And Thanks. I can just add a bit to that is to say that the, the age profile of the vessels also is important because you can't expect the owners who are having vessels of five years from now to just throw off the vessels and start something new. So a biofuel could be an alternative where the existing engines could get into use for it. So that's an opportunity for that sort of a market too. Maybe I add some, uh, we hear a lot of industry entails and uh, perhaps I can add on some data points from patent perspective. I think uh, from our understanding is that all these green fuels, all low carbon fuels are welcomed. 
Uh, each of them have their pros and cons. Like hydrogen is difficult to handle, it's a safety issue. But for ammonia, you also have those uh, uh, NOx emissions, nitro gas emissions, etc. Biofuels are good, are more compatible with current engines. But one thing I want to share from patent data is that take a look at the patent uh, using biofuels for transport. Maybe there are southern inventions around that. But the focus actually, there are 40,000 inventions related to the biofuel generation, which means uh, the innovation focus is actually on the generation part. It's not really on the adoption or application in the industry. And this brings us to a very crucial challenge that if you look at biofuels, although they are good, they are compatible, the key issue is how you secure the supply chain, how you can find enough biofuels to support your industry. Many industries are looking for uh, green fuels or low carbon fuels, but for biofuels, you need to find enough biomass to confirm, convert to biofuels, and that's a big issue. The researchers from academia, from uh, commercial entities are looking at various applications, looking at the different possibilities from plants, from food waste, etc. But the challenge is still that maybe there's not enough biofuels. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, same thing. Um, if I could just go back to Tommy, and I'm, apologies if I'm just picking on you, yeah. How can Harbourcraft operators balance the need for economic viability with the goals of reducing their carbon footprint to achieve net zero emissions? So this sounds like a, a balance between, you know, how do you balance your business as well as uh, tech adoption? Uh, I think for us, in, in our experience, so we started this decarbonization journey as an organization about two years ago. So the reason why we started was because we were at a position where we realized that we had to. Otherwise, we might become irrelevant, like tenders. If you don't provide this solution, they don't even consider your tender bid. So from a business uh, point of view, uh, it is inevitable for businesses such as ours to, to pivot and to, to go towards this direction. It's fast becoming even a basic qualifier to continue running our business. True, uh, cost to a certain extent, it will definitely go up. So I think uh, it's also important to look at the longer term horizon, the sustainability of the business as a whole for longevity, as well as how we can best manage the cost of implementing this technology, be it on a stage perspective or to find certain applications whereby, for example, electrification fits in really well, biofuel brings in really well. So as a whole, we are able to manage this transition uh, very carefully, very incrementally and yet allow us to, to grow and to move forward as a company. Thanks. Thanks, I, George. I would like to uh, add to this. Uh, so as a system grader, we speak to quite a bit of the uh, uh, ship owners, uh, Harbourcraft owners, and uh, uh, Tommy, we one of them that I spoke to earlier. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, Tommy was uh, talking about is depending on the, uh, the, the type of vessels and the profiles that you worked on earlier. So we we, I just want to throw it out that there are opportunities that there are some uh, modifications, uh, retrofits that are available, and there are opportunities that you can use like a parallel hybrid system, a hybrid system on some of the vessels, and that can be added now right on, and you can actually start the journey of uh, decarbonization. Uh, there can also be opportunities that you can uh, change into full electric ready, the whole system is designed as a full electric vessels, but because of the infrastructure of charging solutions, you will still have a generator on board. Now, all this allows you to future-proof your vessels. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Sri uh, Nivan will tell you that they actually have the full electric vessels available, uh, but uh, I think at this moment in time, during the transition period, uh, there are opportunities and there are different uh, uh, variations that can be taken by the industry to move forward, to decarb. Thanks. Srinivas, you want to add in anything? No. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so please do uh, keep your questions coming in. Yeah, And then I see uh, quite a highly voted question here on hydrogen technologies, speaking about other technologies, right? So has the panel considered hydrogen technologies that use interstitial hydrogen storage that store hydrogen, hydrogen safe, safely within a solid metal hydride medium? This is open perhaps to George or even uh, Srinivas if you'd like to share any points. Uh, I, uh, we, we, we did do a study on this. Okay, uh, the, uh, the main issue is that the technology is still pretty new. Uh, as a system regulator, uh, what we are doing is to create 
uh, solutions, and I think uh, it, it transcends the whole entire Singapore maritime industry, is to look into the possibility of in future integrating this system, uh, the possibility of using hydrogen as a power generator source into the propulsion system. Now, uh, in order for you to do that, you have to do uh, development. Uh, we, I was just talking to Dr. Imran about uh, some of the development that we can cooperate together to investigate on the various uh, battery chemistry impact. Now, uh, hydrogen, using hydrogen as a source of uh, fuel for power generation is something that uh, will be looked at, but uh, at this moment in time, because of the infancy of the technology or uh, the availability of the technology to the maritime industry, uh, it becomes something that you have to look into and prepare for, but you, you, it's very difficult for you to actually uh, implement into any of the vessels. Thanks. How about uh, Sunting, any thoughts from you from the patent office, I guess? Looking at the hydrogen, uh, for us, the technology can be two routes. Uh, one is for supply for the fuel cells, the other one for combustion engines. We see for both sides, actually, the patenting is picking up especially for maritime applications. And we also noticed that in the industry uh, in Europe, in China, there are testing ships vessels, not only in land vessels, but also seagoing vessels are being tested. So uh, I would say at current stage, yes, the technology is still at early stage, but it will be good that uh, companies can come in, push the boundary forward, so that uh, it will be more uh, available to the whole industry. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. There's also a question on carbon capture. Um, I'll just flag it right here, but I'm not sure how feasible that would be, though, in terms of a harbor, you know, harbor craft um, setting. And any thoughts from the panelists here? Carbon capture. Well, sorry. Um, uh, there's, uh, I, I just want to share a certain discussion I had uh, in Europe before. Uh, it was last year, and uh, it talks about carbon capture. and. Uh, the, the whole entire discussion came about that um, as long as you are using uh, electric grid, there is an opportunity for the power generation people to capture the carbon. But uh, for, for the users, as long as you're using uh, full electric vessels, then you are already carbon capturing because the, the guys who are generating the, the power, the power plant, can capture the carbon. For, for, for vessels itself, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Sure. So a more solution, uh, an upstream sort of solution, perhaps, yeah? Um, maybe to Srinivas um, on electrification. So for electrification of battery-powered vessels, you know, short charging infrastructures and the power supply uh, is a big concern. So how are you tackling the shore site constraints, perhaps? Yes, this is a, this infrastructure is always a chicken and egg story uh, for, for this part of the game. And um, we are working with uh, the authorities here closely to find a way uh, for a solution. For one of the reasons we adopted another new solution as part again of our innovation is to do battery swapping. Uh, the two things, because from a regulator standpoint, there's always been a challenge of how to do, how safe is charging. Uh, and if you see on the, on the land base, uh, LTA has brought in the TR25 regulation to say how uh, or how you need to set up your system in order to do charging. It's the same for the vessels now that is going to come up to say whether we can adapt TR25 or we should do, bring in something new. Uh, so as that uh, regulatory process is being developed uh, for it, we thought battery swapping is a better solution because you're charging on land and therefore you're following the regulations of the LTA and you're doing no charging on the vessel. Uh, that is one part of uh, the uh, 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 story that can be given in a short term. But long term, yes, you do need to have a lot of uh, 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 available locations for vessels to, to have a charging infrastructure for it. There are solutions. Today, uh, MPA is call, coming up with a few more uh, approaches to bring the industry players to come and put solutions of how we can provide charging solutions in a floating platform uh, or a potential uh, floating bunkering. The current bunkering vessels, can they be a charging solution for, uh, for the vessels for it? So uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities there. Uh, and we are pretty sure is that, that that part of the story will be tackled well. Sure, sure. Tommy, would you like to add in a bit as well? 
So I think for us, I think the fully agree uh, with what the, the discussion regarding the long-term infrastructure development. For us, actually, we will answer this question using uh, with two points. I think firstly, it's uh, optimization. I think the way we run electric vessels right now is going to be a bit different from the way we run diesel vessel. The way we run diesel vessel, usually there's some uh, inefficiency. The way we deploy the vessel, the routing of the vessel. So the moment we electrify this vessel, there's a lot more that we can do. We make use of it. We optimize the route. And so that leads to the, the second second answer. I think it also includes some change in the mindset of the operator. Uh, it's inevitable right now. You compare an electric vessel with a diesel vessel, there's going to be a little bit of a trade-off. Electric vessel performs well in some areas, maybe a bit of degradation in terms of range. So operators need to also adjust their, their mindset as well. Even as simple, like I think what we were discussing uh, earlier before this panel, maybe perhaps dropping the speed by two, three knots, and that itself can solve a lot, a lot of problems. Yeah, so I, I'm just taking a step back. I think we are really scanning through all the different sort of technologies that are available and then seeing how implementable they are you know, for the Harbourcraft segment. And there is a question again on biofuels, um, which, has, which, which is highly voted. Uh, but I think the overarching question here is how achievable you know, is this 2030 target uh, when it comes to fully electric, you know, or pure biofuels or any low carbon uh, fuels. So how, how, how realistic is this uh, achievable? Um, anyone would you like to uh, provide your, your insights? Yeah, sure. I think I can take that because we, we are in a clear approach that we will go fully electric from the beginning. So it's, uh, that's one part of it. But how achievable is it? Uh, to me, I would say the 20 to 30 target is quite achievable. Uh, as of today, yes, there are alternatives like the B-150 as a fuel that can that can put one part of it. But uh, as Tommy just mentioned, the the change in the mindset of how you operate your vessels today when it's fully electric, as compared to what you would do in a traditional vessel. Uh, is an element of change that will have to drive. But how do you bring this change? You have to bring the vessels down. You have to also enhance this with a lot of efficiency technologies that you can. So one of the things we have done is that we've tried to put in as much as possible to bring the, increase the efficiency of the vessel, assuming that it will be uh, as good as a conventional vessel or even better uh, than the conventional vessel. It shouldn't be as good, but it should be definitely much better. Uh, that's when Tommy is going to take one from us. Uh, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, uh, We've invested in, in some, in, uh, as we said, on the technology companies. We invested. We gave, gave them an opportunity to take the floor at where we are today and, and put that technologies in. So is it achievable? We, are comfort we, we believe is it is achievable. Will there be bottlenecks? Yes, there is going to be always a challenge. But we believe that the industry, like uh, Tommy mentioned, it's a no-choice market coming in. So when there is no choice, when the gates are closing, you have to rush through. George, would you like to share as well? Is it achievable? So yes or no, basically. Um, uh, personally, I think the the eventual whether the biofuel 100% uh, blending is achievable is really depending on uh, um, conditions that is out of uh, out of our league. Uh, we can't control what the uh, the, the source. Okay, and uh, it is actually uh, economics that 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 has to make sense. Uh, what I thought that it will, I would like to share on top of this is that uh, one, we can, all the decision maker in every individual company can think about actually taking biofuel maybe as, a, as a also part of the step change because the eventual fuel, fuel or the alternative fuel has not been confirmed. Okay, there are people thinking that it's biofuel, there are people who think that it's hydrogen, alumina, uh, ammonia or methanol. But all this uh, um, alternative fuel has uh, uh, infrastructure that needs to be built. There must be supply chain that is being built up. All these are still in the uh, conditions of building up. Maybe what we should look into is the, is the uh, control or the system or the, or the um, propulsion system that you have to future proof to in order for all this to be accepted. Um, eventually, uh, the finals uh, fuel that will be used is still up to the judge. I mean, no, nobody has decided it yet. So uh, what we think that, uh, or at least myself, 
uh, and the company, we are looking towards uh, uh, providing solutions for uh, the industry where you actually build things like a full electric ready uh, vessel, where eventually it might be full electric for the harbour craft, uh, but you need to actually allow for a fleet of vessels so that infrastructure can be built. If you don't have enough uh, critical mass in terms of uh, electric vessel or plug-in hybrid vessels or plug-in full electric ready vessels. Nobody's going to build uh, public uh, charging, charging stations. So, uh, and for that matter, for the biofuel, uh, if let's say there's no critical mass, nobody's going to bring in and nobody's going to invest uh, money to go and build the, the supply chain. So, uh, in order for that to happen, uh, demand needs to be created or everybody needs to say that, okay, this is the way to go and, and, and then economically, it makes it viable. Thanks. Thanks, George. Uh, to, to Dr. Sun Ting, is there anything that we could um, take insights from, you know, from the other industries when we set targets like 2030, fully electric, uh, fully electric for example? Um, will it be achievable you know, from, from your perspective, perhaps? I think as, as George shared, for the core shop, uh, <coughs> for the shore craft, the fully electric is really achievable. But looking at the biofuels, like, like I just now shared, perhaps uh, we need to secure the supply chain first, because uh, if, uh, if the whole industry is looking at the biofuels as a solution, then there, perhaps there's not enough resources looking at the biofuels. Yeah, this is my thing. Okay, thanks. So um, we have a question I guess specifically to Tommy or Srinivas, um, for new builds, you know, or retrofits of e vessels, uh, will there be sufficient fleet renewal? Uh, re sorry, will there be a sufficient fleet renewable a uh, renewal before 2030, or will your fleet uh, renewable uh, renewal be viable? So maybe from uh, Srinivas first, perhaps. Maybe I can take it first. Um, I think both, is, both have to go hand in hand. It's just not only about new builds, but even retrofits is an important factor in order to, uh, to renewal the fleet to a complete electric or zero, net, zero carbon. Uh, but just for those, of, uh, for those who are addressing the Singapore market in specific, if you look at it, by the, all the harbourcraft vessels put together, uh, we have about 1,600 plus uh, vessels. More than 30% of it are at a 20 years plus range. Converting just the 20-year-old vessels to, to something is definitely a new build option, and that is where the uh, owners of that segment should go into. Uh, the ones below the 10, uh, 10 are only about 15% of the overall market. So it's only that 15% of the fleet that you're thinking needs to go for a retrofit, but looking at your aging profiles, it's, the owners will definitely see that new build is the option uh, for it. Uh, just by the nature of the uh, age of the vessels that is they are going into right now. Thanks. To Tommy? So for us, I, I believe as well that uh, it will be a mix of uh, new build and retrofitting. So in fact, we're actually in the process of retrofitting our existing ferry. So it's a diesel ferry about 10 years old, 30 packs small ferry. We are in the process of converting it to become fully electric. So I think there are two, two, two parts to it. Uh, retrofitting of existing vessel, it gives this vessel a second life. But we need to be careful as well to see what are suitable to be retrofitted. Some might not be suitable from a design perspective, from a structural perspective. Then new build might be a better option. So we see both uh, happening, new build as well as retrofitting, and it's something that we as an organization are pursuing concurrently on both fronts. Thanks, thanks, Tommy. Okay, I'm just looking at the time right now as well, and it's uh, taking about this one minute and about 30 seconds left. Um, so for the panelists here, uh, and you know, to the audience, what would be the key message for today's discussion that you'd like them to take away with? Maybe I can start off with Tommy first, yeah? Thing. So, so for us in, in our team, but, uh, in shipping a bit pixies, we believe very deeply in this mantra to learn, to unlearn, and to relearn. And that is really what allows us to navigate this very rapidly evolving technology landscape so that we can position all our companies to be future ready. Yes, I will just take it from, uh, from Tommy away. The same thing is that the, the learning and unlearning is a very important factor in our uh, journey too uh, for it. But at the same time, while we are learning and unlearning, uh, we add on to something creating opportunities. 
so we allow technology companies to come and present their technologies, and we have a platform where we can put that vessel on board. So we give all those guys to come and create more uh, uh, learnings and unlearnings in the process for it. Yes, Josh. Okay, um, I just uh, my 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 statement will actually include one of the answer to a question that somebody actually put it up. Uh, basically, I think technology is uh, moving ahead, especially for battery technologies and motor technologies. Um, maritime has an advantage in the sense that the EV market and the energy storage land-based market has actually taught us quite a bit. So like thermal runaway issues that was being brought up, uh, that can actually be already a lesson learned. So there are technologies that are moving ahead. So what we need to do is to uh, decide as decision makers whether or not you want to step into uh, process of doing a direct leap into full electric or you do what you call stop step changes where you have uh, full electric ready vessels being built where you actually start the, the, the process of uh, installing battery systems or energy storage systems into your vessels because the crew needs to be taught the crew needs to be taught how to run uh, electric vessels so the whole entire uh, uh, supply chains or supplies, the whole entire training process all needs to go into play. So, so taking the first plunge into that becomes actually very important. And if the question, uh, direct questions on whether energy storage uh, is safe uh, from the thermal runaway uh, uh, problems that we all see on the news, uh, maritime industry do have that advantage because of other people's mistakes. So. That's a good for us. Sure. Sun Ting, any last key points? Yeah, I just follow George's. Uh, if you look at the EVs industry, how the new technologies reinvent the, uh, revamp the whole entire industry, look at the automotive and the change the, from traditional powertrain to the EV nowadays. Uh, we, we are now seeing the, the maritime industry is moving really fast. It's transforming in a very fast pace, and there's a lot of opportunities. So what I can share, maybe perhaps one thing that there are so many technologies available, so many green fields available. There's no yes or no answer to choose which is the final correct answer, which is final technology to be uh, in the end. It's more like utilize our diversity in the marine times applications, keep the technologies uh, this uh, diverse and keep your solutions adaptable. This is just one uh, thing very important during the transition period, meaning that you don't need to focus on a correct answer, but moving a step forward, looking for adaptive answers so that you can transit smoothly to help you grow your business and improve your opportunity and success. Thanks, Sinting. Okay, I think there you have it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are just slightly about two minutes over time. I hope you have uh, learned and perhaps unlearned and then relearned again during this discussion. Um, there are a few questions that we have not answered. Please feel free to approach the panelists and myself. Um, yeah, with that, have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. <laughs>